actions that would actually be taken had to be re-voted on, however. So it was, it was the principles rather than the complete action. I would also say another thing that came out of that meeting, it might surprise you, is actually the uh, shakeout scenario. We, there in 2006, we had just, we were in the process of, the, in the U.S. Geological Survey, who, where I worked at the time, we had a proposal for our, what we called the Multi-Hazards Demonstration Project. We weren't quite sure what we were doing it, with it. And out of the discussions that happened there as the communities came together, was the beginning of the ideas of trying to create the shakeout scenario. We then worked with various uh, stakeholders here in Southern California and got a very strong message that what they wanted from us were scenarios of events. We know that we're getting ready for a big earthquake, but we don't know what we're getting ready for. That was the overwhelming message we were getting from the emergency managers. So out of those partnerships, we continued this here in Southern California, and in 2008, we released the shakeout scenario, and of course, Crete had the first shakeout drill, which by the way, was intended as a one-time event to explain the outcomes of this, uh, uh, Scenario, uh, of the scientific model of what the earthquake would be like, uh, but it of course grew beyond that and it's now uh, happening around the world and I think last year was something like 52 million people participating. So the shakeout scenario was the beginning of a lot. It created a picture of what we saw as the uh, a very detailed picture with hundreds of experts, experts across multiple disciplines, what were the problems we're facing here in Southern California, and it was used a lot by emergency manners. What we didn't see it being used for, though, was to say, okay, what should these problems can we prevent? We weren't seeing it turning into to policy outcomes. Um, so, in that context, we were then looking at this, we watched the first uh, uh, Ordinance get passed in San Francisco on soft first story, and uh, uh, I got convinced to ask for an appointment with the newly elected Mayor Garcetti. Uh, the person who talked to me into it, John Wary, is going to be on your panel, so you can harass him later about this. But you know, you, we got to go tell him about what's going on in San Francisco and see if we can push him to do something. And, and I'll admit, my first thought was like, why bother? They never listen. Look what hasn't happened up till now. But um, he overcame my objections. We got an appointment. It took several months to set it up. And uh, then in a great piece of serendipity, two days before the meeting, the Los Angeles Times released its big expose of the problems with non-ductile concrete buildings. So when I walked into the room with Mayor Garcetti, we had his attention. We told him what was happening in San Francisco, how it had taken 10 years. We needed to get the process going here. And he was great, I want to do it, but I'm not going to spend 10 years at it, I want it in one year. And I was like, there's a reason it took you 10 years, guy, these things don't happen quickly. Um, but we kept on talking, we negotiated it, as, you know, I was at the USGS, and what we ended up doing was creating a literally a technical assistance agreement, a partnership between the USGS and the city of Los Angeles. The USGS put up three quarters of my time, uh, and. Uh, the mayor's office put 20 of his senior staff into the program, and I spent a year at City Hall working with the mayor's staff to develop recommendations of what we thought needed to be done to address three specific buildings, pro problems. One is old buildings, our retrofitting problem, one is the problems with the water system, and the third was the potential vulnerabilities of our telecommunication system. I would point out we did not say we're going to come up with a great plan to cover all, you know, to solve the earthquake problem. We specifically defined things that we knew there were approaches to be taken. It was one of my first political lessons. You set up the problem so you're sure you're going to be successful. It gave us room to have other options, but we knew we could claim success because we knew some things that could be done in each of these regions. Right? I'm not going to spend a little time talking about how this happened before I go to what's coming next. Right? There were some important pieces that were in here. First, we brought in a lot of city constituents. Right? We created three different tech, uh, task forces. One of them was about the engineering issue. Some of the, all, probably most of the members of that uh, committee are in this room at this time. Um, there was also a water task force run out of DWP and a design team that was formed there to analyze what their issues were. And then the telecommunications task force reached out to the four major cellular service providers 
and brought them in to help us create co the context. But we didn't just meet with those people who could, those were the ones who sort of were helping us shape the legislation, actually getting it put together. But there's a lot of other people at stake. And over that year, I had 130 meetings with various stakeholders. Some of them were engineers, like here. Some of them were building, uh, building owners. We met with a building owners and management association several times. The Historical Society, the uh, Central City Association, the Urban Land Institute. We went to all the people that were going to be affected and got them to be part of the process. We talked to them before we knew the final outcome of what we were saying. And then when, they, when we actually created legislation, these people could see their fingerprints in the process. They could see that we listened to them. And that was an incredibly important part of getting them on board. We also focused not on the buildings. We focused on society and the idea that our urban society is in a complex system that's at risk from the events. And we talked about urban disaster resilience, which is defined as having a society that functions after the earthquake. So we weren't focusing on the engineering outcomes. We were focusing on the social outcomes. We defined a set of critical infrastructure that would be needed to function. Water, electricity, gas, communication, and buildings. And we said, on that core basis, you set up all of the pieces that form a society, the necessary things to keep going. And what we were trying to do was obviously not try to prevent all losses, that's impossible, but keep enough parts of it functioning, get it robust enough that we could keep on moving after the earthquake and not be facing real social disruption because that's the part that people understand and respond to. Earthquakes are scary things. These are the things that are you know, disrupting our society. And what we were trying to do is, is we focus on the community, on the economics. You know, when, when people emotionally respond to earthquakes, they're afraid of dying. It's all about life safety. It's about response in that moment. But of course, we're almost certain to live through this event, thanks to a lot of the work of you people. Uh, but what is at risk is our economic viability. How many people can keep on going to work? How bad is it going to be so that people give up and leaving? And by keeping it focused on those issues, the long-term economic consequences made it easier to talk about the short-term economic costs. The result is the resilience by design which is a safety plan that was uh, created, released at the end of that year that I, I spent there with goals over these three different areas. So I said we had one thing to do in each one. We know we got through all of them. Uh, if we look at what's going on in the, uh, on the building side, we have mandatory retrofit of both soft first story buildings and uh, non-ductile concrete buildings. Those were voted on together. We didn't let them get separated, which probably made it a lot easier to get the concrete part through. Uh, we also tried to set up a back-to-business inspection program to facilitate coming back quickly. We also got an excessive damage ordinance that if you have damage in your building in, your earth in an earthquake, you don't just get to repair it, you have to strengthen your building. Uh, the one thing that got stalled was a proposal for a rating system. I, the idea of the rating system, the mayor loved it. I loved it. I thought this is a great idea. Let's share information. I'm a scientist. Information's always a good thing. But we discovered that there really were a lot of problems with it. We backed off from requiring a mandatory rating system, which is partly how we got the building owners to agree to the mandatory retrofit. They would rather have mandatory retrofit than mandatory ratings, let me tell you. Right? They were very worried about the short-term losses that would be involved with it, that people don't make their leasing decisions on the basis of a future earthquake. Um, they also, on the city side, we talked about having the city rate all those buildings and get it out. Getting them rated has turned out to be really difficult when you have a thousand buildings and they cost a lot to do this. Uh, and there's the liability associated with admitting to the potential for life loss. And it's created huge challenges about how to move forward with this. So I, I just, I'm bringing this up because, of course, the idea of a rating system has been very popular in the engineering community. Logically, it makes sense. It turns out emotionally it doesn't do very well at all. Right? 
uh, on the water system. Uh, the city made a commitment to a seismically resistant water system, which is a little bit of saying, we know we need to get there, we're not sure how we're going to pay for it. Uh, but, you know, the idea of seismic resistant pipes, such as these ones shown here, um, they made a commitment that all of the significant uh, uh, parts of the system would be upgraded with these, would be re when they're replaced, would be replaced with seismic resistant pipes. This pipe cost about twice as much as the pipes they were regularly using. They went to American manufacturers who said, oh no, no, we can't do that, you've got to use our pipes. And the city stuck to it and said, no, we're doing seismic resistant pipes, if you don't have them, we aren't buying from you. Guess what? After the next few years, there are now eight different pipe companies that are making pipes that fall within this that have been certified by Tom O'Rourke at Cornell as being um, seismic resistant and the prices are coming down and the city is moving forward. Um, that's one of the big parts of the program is how to upgrade the pipe system. There is also the major issue of the fact that all of our aqueducts have to cross the San Andreas Fault to get to us. The planning has generally been, yeah, so we lose an aqueduct, we've got three others. But of course, to be a magnitude eight means the fault needs to be long enough that all of the aqueducts break at the same time. We are finally getting that information to the appropriate people at the state and they're grappling with it. Uh, the mayor went to the governor and said, we've got to get you engaged. We are now finally having meetings between the state offices and, and the LA Department of Water and Power. And there's a principle also that there will, as the DWP moves forward, the seismic resilience is going to be considered in all of the major projects. Okay. On telecommunications, uh, we, there is the issue around power. It's an issue that goes back and forth. I am showing you here a picture of Cajon Pass, where as it crosses the San Andreas Fault, we have Interstate 15 railway lines, the natural gas line, two petroleum pipelines, and the major electrical distribution system that all cross the San Andreas Fault within about 400 meters of each other as they go through the pass. So uh, we've finally been getting um, a, work, a working group together across the utilities to try and come up with an action plan to work towards finding ways to reduce the vulnerability associated with all of that. Uh, other activities have been taken on within the city. Uh, they passed a mandatory ref uh, ordinance that requires freestanding cell phone towers to be considered emergency services and thus built with an importance factor of 1.5. Uh, because life safety as a standard for cell towers doesn't make a lot of sense. I don't think there's a lot of people living in our cell phone towers, but we really do want to have them functional. Okay. Uh, this was quite successful. Every uh, act that required a city ordinance, a city council vote on it, there were five of them, all of them passed unanimously. We did not have organized opposition to what uh, went through in the city. Um, it is now in a process of implementation, and, and Marissa Ajo, the Chief Resilience Officer of the City of Los Angeles, will be on this panel and get to tell you what I dumped on her as I left the city and she took it up. Because um, I went on to some other cities, all right? Having done this, the Southern California Association of Governments approached us and said, we would really like to see this help for other cities, you know. Los Angeles is definitely the largest city in the region, but there are 191 others. We have a total of 18 million people within the six counties of the Skag region. Only four million of them live within the city of Los Angeles. So uh, at, by this point, as we were discussing these various things, I, uh, uh, I decided to complete my federal service and be able to dedicate myself to working more directly on these policy issues and formed the, uh, the Center for Science and Society and uh, entered into a partnership with the Southern California Association of Governments to support cities that wanted to act as uh, Los Angeles did. Um, we began with a process where I gave seminars to a lot of uh, uh, elected officials. Once the elected officials decided to commit to doing this, we started, we uh, formed up a cohort process to bring together cities that wanted to work at it. Uh, we, the cohorts began a year ago. We had 40 cities that entered the cohorts. And, and the idea was that our job was to support them in what they wanted to do to provide the information, educate them about where the risks really were, and support them as they decided to move forward. 
Um, it is, of course, a process that takes a certain amount of time. Uh, Los Angeles pulled it off in one year by dedicating 20 of the highest level officials within uh, the mayor's office to getting it done. Uh, in other areas, much of it's going more slowly, but it is moving forward. So uh, we have actual completed retrofit of at least software story in Nonducto and in West Hollywood and Santa Monica. They've added in the steel buildings as well. So there are now three cities that have completely passed their legislation and moving forward with implementation. Uh, we have another group of cities, about a dozen, where they're, act where they're actively working on retrofit legislation. And some of them it's already up in front of the, the city council. Some of them are beginning with their assessment of where their buildings are. But all of these cities are actively undertaking work on retrofitting their buildings. And then there are another set of buildings that have considered other actions. Uh, Santa Clarita has developed a major program to helping businesses understand what their non-structural issues are. Santa Clarita is a very new city, it doesn't have a lot of the older buildings. But as we all know, the non-structural damage can greatly exceed what's going on in the, um, uh, on the non-structural side, especially in the newer buildings. And of course then the, the issues around utilities, especially water, also um, these ordinances to have stronger cell phone towers have turned out to be relatively popular. I think it's a pretty easy ordinance to get through because there isn't a lot of, there's only one group that might have any opposition uh, and compared to other people who know they want to have their cell phones. Uh, so they're moving in different ways. I think there's a lot more that's going to be happening over the next year or two. We really have momentum going forward. Um, now I want to bring up one other topic where we are getting um, uh, uh, momentum. Um, as I'm, I'm going to quote here some data from, from Keith Porter, who looked at what people thought they were getting from the new code, right? And it turns out that only about one quarter of your uh, larger population understands that our new code is a life safety only code. And uh, of course, if you're focusing only on uh, collapse prevention, there's a lot more damage that goes beyond that. And Keith found that for every collapsed building in, in Loma Prieta and Northridge, we also had 13 red tags, and for each red tag, 3.8 yellow tags, or 63 buildings that couldn't be fully used after the earthquake for every one that collapsed. By comparing this with what happened in Ada, now for an earthquake, we got similar sorts of numbers. So it helps people understand that collapse prevention is not economic security. Um, when the idea that life, that code is only life safety is explained to people, many of those people wanted to get something more. So we have a code that most people don't understand, and when it is explained to them, they want to do better. The problem, of course, is it costs some amount more money. I think we all know it doesn't cost nearly as much as people think it will. Uh, and so uh, we took this idea to, um, to, to Mr. Nazarian. As you heard, uh, he wasn't able to join us today because his bills have actually made it forward. He's put forward two bills. One of them was to develop, establish a working group to develop a functional recovery standard within three years. Uh, the bill has backed off from making this mandatory. Um, I think in the long run they'll end up there. It's just a political process by which we have to get there. Uh, and then uh, another bill that's mandating the development of inventories of the vulnerabilities. So both looking forward to the new code and looking back at the retrofitting. Uh, both of these bills passed the state assembly. Both of them are being heard by the Senate committee today. Uh, and I think, I think it's pretty likely they're going to pass. We'll have to see. Uh, but uh, with some of the changes that were put in the bill, a lot of the organized opposition has, has gone away. Uh, and we are at least having the discussion and starting the process. And I think we're going to get there. I will tell you that as I look at this, I think that improving the current code, making the current code better, needs to happen at the state level. Because if you, you know, you're sitting in Glendale and they now tell you your building's going to cost 1% more to, to construct, but you can move over to Pasadena and not have it, that's a really easy thing to do. Retrofitting can, 
uh, legitimately be done at the local level. You can't pick up your building, existing building in Glendale and move it over to Pasadena. But on the new codes, there's more opportunity for competition. So uh, we have encouraged this to be happening at the state level. Um, okay, why is it working? Where are we, why have we been able to get where we've gotten? Um, I want to, I have a few ideas out of this, and one of them is because we have very much to base this on the shakeout scenario. Instead of coming in and talking about probabilities, we come in and we give them a story. Here is what the big San Andreas could look, earthquake could look like. What does this mean for you? And people do not make decisions on probabilities. I'm sorry, you guys do, most of the rest of the world doesn't, right? Um, you know, you are the only people in the world who like uncertainty, and when we talk about uncertainty, you know, probabilities, we are focusing on the uncertainties, on what we don't know, right? But to make decisions, they have to believe it's real. And I'll admit that I, when I get asked what the probability of the San Andreas earthquake is right now, I say, it's 100%, just give me enough time. And by taking the scenario approach and making it concrete and making it clear what the consequences are, we were able to tap into the emotional value-based decision-making. A, a public official that wants to do what's best for his city, and now he sees what that really means, is going to be able to move forward. Um, it also emphasizes consensus. You know, the other thing that we love to do with each other is argue. That's what we do, right? That's what peer review is. That's how we find the truth. But when people on the outside hear us in those arguments, they hear that we don't know what they're talking, we're talking about, and therefore it's not worth making a decision that way. By doing on the scenario that we had already gotten the scientific consensus that this is what's really going to be happening, we were able to stay away from those debates. The other part is we really did emphasize the financial outcomes. This has two values. If you really see this is what the cost is in the long run, being able to make a short-term expense to save that long-term money, at least forward-thinking people can make that decision. It also gets our attention off the awfulness of the disaster. I mean, the idea of being trapped in a downed building as the fire comes through is an emotional, distressing thing to think about. And as long as people are thinking about that, the money's going to the firemen. Right? To get the idea that we prevent this from happening, we need to be getting a little less emotional about the discussion. And focusing on money is actually less emotional than focusing on dying. Right? Um, I think another thing that's really important here is this isn't the engineers alone. Right? That we are working across the disciplines. And we are getting that to happen. You know, we started there in 2006 as we did this shakeout that was multidisciplinary. As we came in here, we've got lots of people involved, and we are able to keep the connections going, and that's really important. Um, at the same time, I think it's quite important that we are keeping science and policy separate. Our role is to make sure the decision makers understand the implications of their decisions. It is not our role to make the decisions for them. Nobody elected me mayor of Los Angeles to tell them they have to retrofit a building. Okay? They did elect Mayor Garcetti to do that. And it needs to be clear what the difference is. You know, one of the problems is, as a citizen, I look at the consequences, and I have a pretty strong idea what I want to see my elected officials do. But in this context, my role is to make sure they understand those implications so it's their decisions. We then get stronger advocates when they understand why it's happening and it is their own decision. They're going to fight for it much more than if we just tell them that's the most important thing to do. Right? And I would also point out that if the scientists start making policy, we are inviting the policy makers to start making science. And that's not something that we want to see happen. <laughs> Um, I think another important part is we really did engage the stakeholders. We got ownership in the results. This is not something coming out of the technical side. It's not something just coming out of City Hall. There is a widespread support for this, and that's one of the reasons it's able to go on to the other cities. 
Uh, and finally, I'll just say we need to remember that relationships matter. And I didn't just, you know, this didn't happen out of the blue. It came because of a long time of working together and continuing to work together and continuing to support them as they're trying to do the implementation because we really all are in this together. Thank you.